May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be worthy in thy sight. O God, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Good news. They were preaching good news as they went out among the people. But not everyone saw it as good news. Paul and Peter were in the midst of an of a argument because both of them, so was Jesus, all were Jewish. They had read the Bible and digested all the books on the rules of behavior for Jewish people. These books and laws did not come from God. They came from the Jews as they set up their religion. They set up sacrifices. They set up donations. They did everything that you would have to do to be a good Jew. Therefore, people would give to the church the first of the grain, the firstborn lambs, goats, cattle, for the church to use, not for a bad purpose, because they used them to feed the poor. It was a way of ensuring that the poor were looked after. Their intentions were good, but when you've got a book of rules, what do you do? You follow the rules, unless you're driving in Ontario. But if you're following the rules, none of the rules had the one word we look for, love. None of them understood they had to love God. They only wanted to follow this set of very narrow rules and they would be accepted into heaven. Paul is telling Peter, you can't judge the Gentiles by the Jewish rules. They are not bound by them. They don't live by them. Therefore, you cannot judge the Gentiles. Peter had been going out to try to convert the Gentiles to Christianity. Apparently he had a very good reception. Except for one thing. He stopped. He stopped eating with them. He stopped going to see them and visit them. Because the Jews were telling him he was wrong. He was breaking the law, the Jewish or Mosaic law. And he should not be spending his time with the Gentiles. And he started to feel so guilty that he actually stopped going to see them. Paul said to him, the Jewish law is flawed. The Jewish law is flawed because that is what killed Jesus. They followed the law and they strung him up on a cross and watched him die. This law was not fair and therefore the rest of it was suspect. Paul, at the time of the crucifixion, gave up following all of the Jewish law and set his heart and soul on faith in Christ and started living a different life so that he would now be following the teaching of Jesus. The Gospel goes on from here and says, in its own way, that the Gentiles and Jesus, I thought they were very similar to the Jews. They started gossiping about him behind his back. 
because they could not accept that he could forgive sins. There's another reading somewhere that says the Jewish people use that to convict him. He also was challenged challenged because Jesus didn't like the laws. He steps up and stands in the face of them, saying they're wrong, and runs face into a conflict with the Jews. Because the laws were, in fact, too rigid and not open enough. Jesus gave us two laws. Love God, love your neighbor. That's the only two laws as far as he was concerned we needed. Show your love for them. Teach them. The woman who came into the house, Simon's house, the Galilean, when he came into the house, she came into the house, it was common practice in those days not to close your doors. For one thing, it's very hot. Closing the doors doesn't help the situation. But the other thing, everyone is always welcome to come in. She came in, welcome. There was a tradition that the owner of the house would let you bathe your feet so you bring, didn't bring dust through the house and give you a cloth to wipe them dry so you weren't tra tracking water through. And then in order to get some of the dust down on your head, they gave you some oil to look after your hair. In this case, the host did nothing. The woman came in. She fulfilled all of his obligations. With her tears, she washed his feet. With her hair, she dried his feet. And she anointed his feet with ointment, which probably was worth about two or three times as much as oil. So that particular thing she did cost her a lot of money. When she was there, Jesus said, your sins are forgiven you. And this gossip started. I thought for a minute I was reading a story before. I looked back and I said, no, it's, gen it's the uh, Gentiles who are there saying exactly the same thing the Jews were in order to convict them. No support at all. So Jesus said it a different way and suggested that her sins would be forgiven her, but he didn't say your sins are forgiven in order to placate all of the people in the room. But nowhere in this story do we hear even one of those people that were gossiping, Simon who had fallen down on his duties as a host, or anybody else who were committing sins ask for forgiveness. Jesus had already told the story of the forgiving of the large loans. One for 500, one for 50. Who would be the most thankful? Person that owed 500. When you think about it, the woman, who everyone called a sinner, had the most need of forgiveness. Who would be the most thankful? The woman. Who would be the person going to heaven? The woman. If you don't acknowledge your sins, you can't be forgiven. A little thing at the end caught my attention. Just a little last few verses. He talked about the women traveling with him and the disciples as they went around the run around the country spreading the good news. They mentioned names, Mary Magdalene. 
They mentioned uh, Susanna and Joanna. And then they went to say, you remember that Judas was the keeper of the purse. But who was the major contributors? The major contributors were women who gave. And they said at the end of our reading that they were giving to him and the disciples. And from their own means, and they helped them to go around and do their ministry. Something that was unheard of at that time. So they have opened everything up. We see all sorts of things here. But we really have to learn ourselves how to be Christians. How to reach out to others. How to call them into the church. I was watching a show not long ago and on the television and the preacher said will you come to my church next Sunday? And the person who he asked said why should I come to your church? And the preacher, preacher stood uh, flabbergasted and said, uh, uh, I don't know. Maybe we all should know when we ask a person to come to our church. Why would you want to come to my church? Why would you want to leave your religion and join ours? And above all, we have to remember those two commandments that guide our life. First one, love God. And that includes Jesus and the Holy Spirit because God is three in one. And love thy neighbor. There is no designation anywhere about who your neighbor is. But if you don't know who it is, they must be your neighbor. All neighbors should be getting help and love. And you'll notice I haven't asked for money anywhere in this sermon. But we will have to ask later in the service for something else. But just for your information, I hope that you can all go out there and invite people and have a very, very good reason for inviting them. And I'm looking at all these faces looking at me. I see thousands of good reasons. Everybody who wishes should be able to come up with at least one. And there's some beautiful bright faces up there. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>